Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. In 2017, John Kelly, serving as Donald Trump's chief of staff, was interviewed by Fox News' Laura Ingram. Ingram asked about Kelly's thoughts on a church in Virginia that had recently taken down a statue to Robert E. Lee. Kelly responded that Robert E. Lee had been an honorable man who, quote, gave up his country to fight for his state. But what fired up controversy even more than his awful take on Lee was what Kelly said next. Kelly claimed that the war had been caused by a, quote, lack of ability to compromise. Historians around the United States groaned and took to Twitter to correct the record. For Civil War historians in particular, Kelly's statement gave us flashbacks to our comprehensive exams, trying to make sense of waves of historiography during the 20th century in which historians went back and forth about the causes of the Civil War. And in fact, while many contemporary historians strongly disagreed with Kelly's take, the failure to compromise was, for a long time, agreed upon as the cause of the conflict. But it wasn't the only one. For decades, historians fell more or less into two camps when it came to the causes of the Civil War. One argued that the war was an inevitability, or, to borrow a phrase from William Seward, an irrepressible conflict. The other, on the other hand, saw the war as the result of a series of failures caused by a blundering generation. Since then, historians have continued to go back and forth about the coming of the war to varying degrees. Today, when asked the reason for the Civil War, most of us would immediately and correctly say slavery. And nearly all historians would support that. But still, the question nags. What about slavery caused a violent, protracted civil war? What event or issue or Supreme Court case or compromise was the straw that broke the camel's back? Or was it the competing cultures of North and South that did it, both created and exacerbated by the existence of Black chattel slavery? Today, as we continue to explore the concept of causality as a historical thinking skill, we're talking about the causes of the American Civil War. I'm Sarah. And I'm Averill. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. <laughs> Can you believe it's been six years since we announced the launch of Dig? No, I can't. (laughs) I know. It makes me want to throw up. We wouldn't have come this far or kept at it if it hadn't been for you all, our listeners. We're thankful for all of our listeners, new and returning, overseas and domestic, student in college or student in life. We're especially thankful for the patrons of this show who have funded our presentations at conferences, the new equipment we're recording on right now, and our endless book needs for research. A big thanks to our fabulous auger and excavator level patrons, Carl, Hannah, Lauren, Colin, Edward, Iris, Susan, Denise, Agnes, Jesse, Karen, Maria, and Audrey. We can't thank you enough. Listener, if you are not yet a patron of this show, it's easy. Just go to patreon.com slash digpodcast to learn more. Oh, yeah. Before we dive in, I want to start by acknowledging the historians who did the research and writing that I used to write this episode. I was very lucky that a really smart forum on the causes of the Civil War came out in the journal Civil War History just as I was sitting down to write this. It was incredible timing. The forum was based on a 1974 article by preeminent scholar of the Civil War era, Eric Foner, which I relied heavily on, and the reflections on and responses to his article um, also really helped guide my thinking. Those historians uh, involved in that forum were Aaron Astor, Judy Geisberg, Kelly Carter Jackson, Martha S. Jones, Brian Matthew Jordan, James Oakes, Jason Phillips, Angela M. Riotto, Anne Sarah Rubin, and Venetia Sina. 
I also returned to one of my old standbys, Bruce Levine's book, Half Slave and Half Free, which is my favorite easily readable history of the road to war. On the question of inevitability, I really liked an op-ed that David Blight wrote for the New York Times Magazine in 2022. I also consulted articles by historians past and present, including James G. Randall, Michael Woods, and J. Morgan Couser. So, when I teach classes on the Civil War, I usually have a point partway through the semester, usually around the time that we uh, arrive at the moment when the sectional crisis is, is about to become a shooting war with the first shots at Fort Sumter, and we have a class debate about the causes of the Civil War. We don't focus on big things like economic differences or even actually on slavery as like a larger overarching concept, but instead on very specific things. I start them out with a fairly concrete and unsurprising list, including the big events and the crises of the 1850s, such as the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Fugitive Slave Act, and John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. But then I ask them to brainstorm more, quote unquote, causes. And pretty soon the chalkboard begins to look like the Pepe Silvia conspiracy theory board from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. One semester, we had probably three dozen causes on the board, ranging from the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 to the arrival of the first ship bearing enslaved Africans in 1619. Then, after crowdsourcing a huge list, I tell students, we need to narrow it down to the 10 most important. Then when we do that, the five most important. Then eventually, we try to narrow it down to the single most important cause of the Civil War. The result of this is usually a lot of spirited debate and discussion. I think there was some yelling last time I did this. We always come up with one answer, but it's not an easy process. And usually at least a couple of students vehemently disagree with the end result. Part of the takeaway of that kind of activity is that you can't actually narrow the causes of the Civil War down to just one thing. It forces students to reckon with how all of those causes are actually interconnected, intertwined, and interrelated. Right. Could John Brown have led a raid at the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry that made Southerners shiver with terror if he had not already cut his teeth during the skirmishes of Bleeding Kansas? And could that conflict have happened without the Kansas-Nebraska Act? But could the Kansas-Nebraska Act have made an impact if it wasn't for the Missouri Compromise? But even that aside, one of the other effects of this exercise is that it also tends to reinforce one particular way of thinking about the coming of the Civil War. So for example, the last time I played this game, students brilliantly narrowed down the list until they had one last cause left, the United States Constitution. It was an incredible moment. It was the kind of galaxy brain moment you're, you're hoping for when you're teaching. But it also brought us to an odd place in terms of historical thinking. If the Constitution was ultimately what caused the Civil War, were we actually saying that the Civil War was inevitable? Let's start, though, not with an exploration of historiographical debates, but instead with an incredibly brief description of the years before the Civil War. Please know that this cannot be exhaustive, detailed, or deep. Historians have written literal volumes on the decades before the Civil War, and we simply can't include every single detail without making this episode into a multi-part podcast series on the Civil War, which Sarah would love and the rest of us <laughs> would hate. <laughs> We're going to be, be brief. Great. Yeah, no, it'd be terrible. We're going to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Shut your mouth. We're going to be brief and concise, but all these deep issues deserve deep study and analysis. We'll come back to them maybe in future episodes, but we also hope you do your own reading. For reading recommendations, hit up Sarah, Twitter, email, whatever for a chat. The first enslaved Africans arrived in the American colonies in 1619 when a slave ship delivered 20 and odd Negroes to Virginia. Initially, slavery was one form of several forms of unfree labor, and it didn't necessarily mean being considered chattel or property or being enslaved for life. It also wasn't necessarily initially considered an inherited position. 
Enslaved Africans worked alongside white indentured servants in the northern and the southern colonies. Over the course of the 17th century, though, colonies began to pass laws that set rigid boundaries around what it meant to be enslaved. In 1640, Virginia sentenced a black man named John Punch to slavery for life. Punch is considered the first permanently enslaved person in American history. Then in 1662, Virginia passed another law that held that children followed the status of their mothers, meaning that children born to an enslaved woman would themselves be enslaved. These two laws were followed by many more in the colony of Virginia that helped to establish the status of slavery as permanent and linked to race. Also during the late 17th century, a number of changes meant that there were fewer indentured servants available to work on American colonists' sugar, tobacco, and indigo plantations. The Great Fire of London, the English Civil War, and a disease outbreak in England made for fewer available people and fewer interested in moving to the colonies to serve as indentured servants. Then, in 1676, a violent uprising of white indentured servants called Bacon's Rebellion made wealthy landowners skittish about having large populations of poor, disgruntled indentured servants. While slaves were far more expensive, they were also a better long-term investment. Throughout the late 17th and early 18th century, the enslaved population steadily grew, especially in the southern colonies, where cash crops made up the bulk of the economy. After the American Revolution, the founding generation decided that slavery posed a real challenge in framing a new government. While the Constitution does not mention slavery, it's a document profoundly shaped by the debate from northern and southern states at the Constitutional Convention over how to account for the enslaved population. In order to appease the southern states, which had a larger and more entrenched enslaved population, Northern states gave concessions, such as the Three-Fifths Clause, which gave southern states increased representation in Congress, and the Fugitive Slave Clause, which required the return of the enslaved who sought freedom. As an aside, slavery did exist in the North, but on a lesser scale and was on its way to abolishment during the first quarter of the 19th century. As a result, the southern states consistently enjoyed strong political power in and out of Congress. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson doubled the size of the United States with the Louisiana Purchase. While slavery didn't immediately pose a crisis in the new territory, it did raise new questions. Were these new territories open to slavery? Could enslavers take their bonds people with them to new lands, effectively extending and increasing the political power of the southern states? The question was tested in 1820, when the Missouri Territory, smack dab in the middle of the Louisiana Purchase, sought admission to the United States as a state. Slavers had taken their bounds people into the new territory as they sought farmland, and in turn wanted the territory to be added as a slave state. But this posed a problem. More or less coincidentally, there had always been an equal number of slave and free states, and Missouri would tip that balance. That balance was critical to keeping together faith in the United States government, and many Americans believed in what historians have called the slave power conspiracy, or the idea that the increased wealth and representation that slavery endowed in the South gave them immense power that they used to constantly manipulate things for the benefit of the Southern states. In 1820, after much debate, Congress landed on an agreement in what became known as the Missouri Compromise. Missouri would enter the Union as a slave state, and Maine, or the northern chunk of Massachusetts, would enter as a free state, keeping that fragile balance in place. But it also established the longitudinal line of 3630 as the demarcation line between the slaveholding South and the free North. North of that line, slavery could not exist. South of it, it could not be infringed. This, politicians reasoned, would solve the problem long into the future. Over the course of the next decades, there was an agricultural boom in the South focused on one crop and one crop alone. Cotton. Before the end of the 18th century, cotton was unprofitable. It was too laborious to disentangle the sticky seeds from the soft fibers so the cotton bowl could be processed into cloth. But in 1790, the cotton gin, short for the cotton engine, 
revolutionized cotton production, easily and quickly processing cotton balls so that they could be utilized by the booming textile industry, largely located in England. Suddenly, cotton was the most profitable cash crop in the United States and perfectly suited for the rich soil of the Deep South. But cotton required labor for planting, tilling, picking, and processing. And so along with the cotton, enslavement boomed. Enslaved people were worth more money, creating an internal marketplace in bonds people and creating incentive for a reproductive economy as enslaved women could be used to increase stock and generate income. It was also so profitable that it created a demand for even more land, meaning slaveholders hoped to be able to seize Western lands to allow slavery to spread and grow. With the cotton boom, slavery became more widespread, more entrenched, and more vital than it had ever been in Southern society. Soon, slavery was made the centerpiece of Southern culture and the cornerstone of everything from family family life and gender roles to concepts of citizenship. The existence of slavery informed and shaped every social interaction in the slaveholding South. At the same time, an anti-slavery movement was growing, largely in the northern states. The first anti-slavery groups were city or state-specific, such as the New York Manumission Society, founded in 1790. But these early anti-slavery groups, which largely embraced ideas about gradual emancipation or even colonization, became more of a social and cultural force during the Second Great Awakening, the period of religious revival and reform that we've talked about 127 times on this show. Eager to rid society of sin, some reformers set their sights on slavery as a moral wrong that must be rooted out now. In 1833, the abolitionist movement got a radical new leader, William Lloyd Garrison. Garrison was an extremely vocal, extremely focused abolitionist who used his widely read newspaper, The Liberator, to argue that slavery was America's original sin. Garrison was famous for his inflammatory tactics, such as burning the U.S. Constitution at a public gathering, declaring it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. But while Garrison could be a rabble rouser, abolitionists mostly used softer tactics like moral suasion or using moral arguments to try to get people to change their mind. Moral suasion mostly happened through poems, pamphlets, speeches, and books, especially novels like Uncle Tom's Cabin, which were designed to reveal the horrors of slavery to public audiences. Memoirs were especially effective, so abolitionists sought out escaped slaves like Harriet Jacobs, Solomon Northrup, and Frederick Douglass to write their life stories. Abolitionists also existed on a spectrum. Some were more comfortable just passing out pamphlets, while others were more active and radical, such as opening their homes to fugitives. Either way, what most of them shared was a belief that slavers were cruel, abusive, and immoral. On the flip side, of course, slavers saw abolitionists as a threat to their very way of life. As slavery became immensely popular and embedded in Southern culture, it meant that it was increasingly impossible for Southern whites to easily accept that they couldn't just take their property with them wherever they chose to live. Whites, for instance, started moving into Mexico in the territory we now know as Texas, bringing their slaves with them, though Mexico had outlawed slavery in 1829. In 1835, the Americans living in Texas rebelled against the Mexican government, which ended in 1836 with Texas declaring its independence. Nine years later, Texans wanted to join the Union as a southern slave state. This wouldn't violate the 3630 boundary, but it again threatened the delicate balance between slave and free states. Problem was, Mexico still claimed Texas as its territory, and wasn't willing to let the region go without a fight. Further, President James Polk, a virulently (laughs) pro-slavery Southerner himself, saw the conflict with Mexico as an opportunity rather than a crisis. He was a firm believer in in Manifest Destiny, and the belief that the U.S. was destined to spread from Atlantic to Pacific. For that to become a reality, the U.S. needed more Mexican territory. By 1848, after a short war, Mexico relinquished control of Texas, 
and ceded a massive chunk of land, the Mexican Cession, to the U.S., giving it what would become later California, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and parts of New Mexico, Colorado, and Montana. Polk and his cronies didn't just want this territory to fulfill a nationalistic idea about stretching from sea to shining sea, but because it would exponentially increase potential territory for slavery to spread. And of course, the new land gained from the Mexican session raised the same old problem. Should this new territory be open or closed to slavery? From the very beginning of the Mexican-American War, a congressman named David Wilmot introduced a piece of legislation that became known as the Wilmot Proviso. By 1845, the careful balance created by the Missouri Compromise was already a thing of the past. Arkansas and Florida had tipped the scale towards the slave states already. But the vast territory added by uh, the Mexican Cession could potentially change the game completely. So unsurprisingly, the Wilmot Proviso fails, but not before it also helps to blow up the political party system. Rather than voting in terms of policy or platform, politicians increasingly vote in terms of region, split largely over the issue of slavery. Soon, each party had regional factions or wings, the Northern and Southern Whigs, the Northern and Southern Democrats. The Wilmot Proviso was a key moment where politicians split over the vote not based on their party's general ideology, but over their region's position on slavery. Congress had to make a decision about what to do with the vast lands added by the Mexican Cession. The decision came in the form of the Compromise of 1850. Under the Missouri Compromise Law, the Cession land should be split in half by the 36-30 line. But Southerners couldn't abide the idea that all this new territory would be cut off from the potential of slavery. And Northerners couldn't abide the idea of slavery spreading all the way uninhibited to the Pacific. The Compromise was a series of laws, collectively known as the Compromise of 1850, that essentially kicked the can down the road. California would become a free state, but the rest of the unorganized Southwest Territory would be left undeclared. The slave trade was also prohibited in Washington, D.C. To appease the South, Congress strengthened the Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution with the Fugitive Slave Act, which provided strict enforcement for the capture and return of an escaping bonds people. Now, federal officials, not state ones, decided whether an escaped slave should be returned to slavery or let free, and local authorities could not interfere in any way, making it more certain that escapees, and free people mistaken for slaves or kidnapped, would be returned to bondage. Previously, the Supreme Court had ruled that local authorities didn't have to comply with the Federal Fugitive Slave Clause, but the Fugitive Slave Act took away that possibility. As abolitionists tried to defy the Fugitive Slave Act, things sometimes devolved into violence, such as in Syracuse, New York, when abolitionists tried to save escapee Jerry Burns, or in Christiana P.A., where abolitionists killed a slaver coming to recover his property. The Fugitive Slave Act also helped to radicalize apathetic Northerners who saw questions of slavery and freedom playing out on their very own doorsteps. The political schisms happening over slavery resulted in what historians call the third party system, or the third era of political parties in the United States. The Whig Party disintegrated by 1852, sending its members to some new, small third parties, including the nativist Know Nothing Party, the abolitionist Liberty Party, and the free labor-focused Free Soil Party. During the 1850s, these third parties more or less coalesced into the Republican Party, which was focused on stopping the spread of slavery into the West, not because they were morally opposed to the existence of slavery, but because the spread of slavery would make it impossible for free labor for white men to exist in those new territories. In other words, why pay a white laborer a decent wage if you could just buy or rent an enslaved person? The Republican Party wasn't an abolitionist organization, nor was it an anti-racist organization. 
but it did speak to the needs of working class people in a way that the Democratic Party struggled with because of its steadfast and radical commitment to slavery. Over the course of the 1850s, what would eventually be termed the sectional crisis became dire. The solution created by the Compromise of 1850 really proved a mirage when Congress had to decide how to address the territory in the middle of the country, the area that today is the states of Kansas and Nebraska. But Southern politicians wouldn't allow them to officially become territories if they would be closed to slavery. Again, this should have already been answered by the Missouri Compromise, but Southerners weren't happy to let slavery remain where it already was. The cotton boom was too profitable, and the enslaved bodies were too profitable. To continue to thrive, slavery needed new markets. Stephen Douglas, a senator from Illinois, was invested in the question about Kansas and Nebraska because he hoped it would facilitate a transcontinental railroad that would take a route benefiting his home state. In order to make that happen, he needed to win the votes of Southern congressmen, which meant he needed to appease them. Douglas authored yet another compromise, which established that instead of using a dividing line, future states would use something called popular sovereignty, which is fancy political language for a simple vote or referendum. Under the Kansas-Nebraska Act, these new territories would choose by popular vote whether they wanted to become slave or free. This... uh as you might guess, was a messy, violent failure because immediately abolitionists and slavers both rushed to flood the Kansas territory in order to skew the votes. We should actually do an entire episode on just bleeding Kansas because it's an incredibly complex story, but suffice it to say, yeah, Averill's making a face, but it would be a very good episode. Um, But suffice it to say, the the conflict in Kansas that becomes known as Bleeding Kansas did not help <laughs> the growing sectional crisis, right? As rival governments were established in Kansas, political differences became violent. Radical abolitionist John Brown avenged the burning of an abolitionist settlement by killing several pro-slavery men quite brutally in May 1856. And abolitionists were armed with rifles purchased by abolitionist ministers back on the East Coast. Two days before John Brown murdered those pro-slavery men, um, abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, had been brutally beaten by South Carolina Congressman Preston Brooks on the floor of the Senate in retaliation for giving a fiery speech calling out Southerners for the moral outrages of slavery. Brooks's attack on Sumner was also a flashpoint in a culture war. They were two very different men from two completely different cultures come together in a bloody conflict. The caning was like a microcosm of the larger cultural conflict in America and its potentially bloody consequences. The political sectional crisis was quickly becoming an everything crisis. Just a few months later, the Supreme Court issued a decision in a case called Dred Scott v. Sanford. Dred Scott and his wife Harriet were enslaved along with their daughters by a U.S. Army surgeon named Dr. John Emerson. Since Emerson served in the Army, he moved around the U.S. living in different posts throughout the 1830s and 40s, including ones in Illinois and the Minnesota and Wisconsin territories, where slavery was prohibited by the Missouri Compromise Line of 3630. When Emerson died in 1843, the Scots tried to purchase their freedom from his widow, offering about $300, which is about $9,000 today. She refused. That's when Dredd and Harriet each filed suit against her, claiming that they were already free based on a Missouri law that held that an enslaved person held for a long period in a free state was therefore free. It was a long process. The Scots won one case, but then lost when Emerson's widow appealed the decision. The Scots kept trying, eventually culminating in Scott v. Sanford, so named because ownership of the Scots now had been transferred to Emerson's brother-in-law, John Sanford. The case went before the Supreme Court in 1857, where Justice Roger Taney issued the now infamous decision. Taney made three main arguments. 
one, that any person descended from African heritage, whether enslaved or free, was not a citizen of the United States, meaning they had no ability to use the court system. Two, that any pre-existing laws that banned slavery in a region did not confer freedom or citizenship to Black Americans. And three, that the Missouri Compromise which had prevented slavery from moving above the 3630 line, was unconstitutional. Tawney also spoke the words that would be associated with him for all time, that Black Americans, quote, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. By his reasoning, Black Americans were not and never had been, quote, part of the people, end quote. And that the founding documents, quote, show that a perpetual and impassable barrier was intended to be erected between the white race and the one which they had reduced to slavery. The Scott decision was a powerful turning point. Now, slavery was the law of the land, and no law passed in any singular state or territory could interfere with a slaver's right to bring their human property with them. A master from South Carolina, theoretically, could move their farm up to Pennsylvania and would have the Supreme Court to back up their legal right to do so. Thus, by 1858, it was also abundantly clear that the biggest single issue between the Democrats and the Republicans was slavery. In 1858, the race for a Senate seat in Illinois put the issue into sharp focus as the candidates Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln took part in a series of campaign debates forever after known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates. In the debates, Lincoln clarified what it meant to be against the spread of slavery, but also not anti-racist. I'm going to read a long quote, but just be aware that some of the language I'm going to read is not acceptable today, but was common in the 1850s. From the fourth Lincoln-Douglas debate, September 18th, 1858, Lincoln says, quote, I am not, nor have ever been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say, in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together in terms of social and political equality. And as much as they cannot so live, while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. I say upon this occasion, I do not perceive that because the white man is to have the superior position, the Negro should be denied everything. I do not understand that because I do not want a Negro woman for a slave, I must necessarily want her for a wife. My understanding is that I can just let her alone. End quote. I know it's it's a rough quote, right? It's a rough quote. He's being incredibly transparently racist and yet he's also articulating something that was fairly radical for the time right which is that no i wouldn't marry a black woman but that doesn't mean that i that that black people must be denied all rights in our society right Right. it's it's such a gross attempt to ride the line of like upholding a necessary level of white supremacy that's expected and also trying to make an argument against slavery as an institution. Yeah. And slavery was the central issue for this senatorial race. And it seemed clear to Southerners that Republicans like Lincoln, should they ever achieve power would be a major threat to their peculiar institution. And while Lincoln lost the 1858 Senate race, he had garnered national attention. And early in 1860, he was invited to give a speech in New York City at the lecture venue, Cooper Union, which made him a public figure closely associated with criticizing the slave power. In 1859, John Brown, the radical abolitionist who had led a violent raid against slavers in the chaotic Kansas Territory, took another radical action in hopes of instigating the violent end of slavery in the United States. In October 1859, Brown led a small group of white and black men to seize a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, a tiny town in what was then northern Virginia. Now it's West Virginia. 
His goal, roughly, was to seize the weapons in the arsenal and distribute them to enslaved people across the South, setting off a massive rebellion that would overthrow the slave power. This wildly impractical plan failed, unsurprisingly, um, and Brown, also unsurprisingly, was immediately arrested and very quickly put on trial and found guilty of treason. On December 2nd, 1859, John Brown was hanged. Nearly a year later, Republican and free soiler Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. Southern states, starting with South Carolina, refused to accept the outcome of that election, convinced that Lincoln was bent on abolishing slavery. Just over a month after Lincoln's election, and months before he was inaugurated, South Carolina voted to secede from the Union, followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina between January and May of 1861. Before the final three states had even passed their secession ordinances, shots were already fired and the Civil War had begun. Whew, that was a lot. <clears throat> so now let's zoom out a little bit. There's something about this recitation of facts that makes it feel like a civil war or the civil war was a foregone conclusion. Even writing it, I actually struggled to make sure that I didn't use any language that made it sound like all those events were part of a process moving inevitably in one direction. Using phrases like John Brown's raid brought the nation to the brink or the Dred Scott decision moved the nation even closer to a breaking point include within them assumptions that the war was coming. For historians working today, though, it's considered passe to suggest that an event or an outcome was inevitable. To believe that certain events are inevitable means believing that we aren't actually agents in our own lives, but instead passive objects pushed along by forces larger than ourselves. Historians now tend to embrace the idea of contingency, or the idea that there are endless possible eventualities, all reliant on momentary cause and effect. But while historians today reject the idea that anything can be inevitable, historians in the past were far less opposed to the concept. In the early 20th century, especially in the period between World War I and the Cold War, American historians hotly debated whether the Civil War was, in fact, inevitable. In the interwar era, many of the leading American historians believed strongly in the idea of inevitability and saw the Civil War as a case in point. Woodrow Wilson, who in addition to being a racist and the president of the United States, was an academic historian pen and penned an egregiously long book series called A History of the American People. Wilson leans incredibly heavily on inevitability as a historical force in matters both minor and major. Describing the election of 1860, for instance, Wilson wrote that, quote, the Democratic Party was at last hopelessly rent into factions, divided, as was inevitable between Stephen Douglas and John Breckinridge because of sectional differences. The end of the war was also described as fated, quote, by spring, Wilson wrote, as Sherman swept slowly northward through the Carolinas for a final injunction with Grant in Virginia, the inevitable had been accepted and the war was over. In James Truslow Adams' The Epic of America, he treats the war itself as an, an inevitability. The first rumbling of the inevitable conflict, Adams wrote in 1931, was heard with the controversy over admitting Missouri as a slave state in 1819. For historians like Wilson and Adams, history was moved along by epic forces, not by individual decision making. These works weren't without criticism. While Wilson and Adams, among others, did situate slavery as the issue driving the inevitability, others, like the hugely influential Charles and Mary Beard, <laughs> I wrote bear, <laughs> The hugely influential Charles and Mary Beard, who argued that economic differences, not slavery, was the actual reason spurring the coming war. Later in the 1930s, other historians questioned inevitability itself. The horror and destruction of World War I had given some historians a very different perspective on war. 
James G. Randall, for instance, argued vehemently that the war was not a given. The sectional and cultural conflicts were very real, Randall admitted, but, quote, what is not so clear is the assumption that because of this agrarian industrialist controversy, the Civil War was inescapable. For after all, some of the new writers do little more than give the overworked phrase irrepressible conflict a fresh socioeconomic twist. The present writer is yet unconvinced that the tragic conflict had proved to be inevitable. Instead, Randall saw the war as an avoidable tragedy, a rending of the social fabric by a fanatical minority of abolitionists and fire eaters who upped the ante until it resulted in mass death and destruction. Randall didn't believe in any, quote, formula or determinism that drove history, but rather simple human decision making. The field moved on after World War II, and historians generally became less interested in the question of the war's causes and more interested in the economics of slavery and social histories of the war era. But if historians are now less convinced that a historical event can be inevitable, we still struggle to clearly articulate in our histories how the Civil War did come to happen. While it's, quote, antithetical to the historian's craft, inevitability remains utterly beguiling, to quote the historian David Blight. Or, to put it another way, in the words of Kelly Carter Jackson, quote, historians are reluctant to label anything as inevitable, and yet the Civil War feels like trying to stave off the effects of global warming. Even those of us who don't believe in inevitability, when we try to write or tell a narrative history of the decades before the war, find ourselves telling a story full of critical turning points, moving us toward what we know will happen. The Civil War did happen. So what was the moment or the event that brought it about? Historian David Potter argued that by 1847, during the Mexican War, the essential conflict, as he phrased it, over slavery was already fully articulated, quotes. For Kenneth Stamp and David Blight, it was 1857 and the Dred Scott decision, which Blight argues, quote, brought to a head tensions that had been growing throughout the 1850s. And the events of the decades before the war do fall into a kind of progressive narrative, with one event layering on top of another, naturally creating a narrative moving in one direction. As we tell the story of American history from the Missouri Compromise to the Compromise of 1850 to the Kansas-Nebraska Act to Bleeding Kansas to Dred Scott to Harper's Ferry, the political, cultural, and social situation grows increasingly dire. Could it have ended some other way? That sense of a faded conclusion gets even stronger when we consider the weirdly prescient things that people wrote and said during the decades before the war. In 1820, Thomas Jefferson wrote with great anxiety about the Missouri Compromise to politician John Holmes, quote, This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a, a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated, and every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper. We will have the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. End quote. In 1846, as the United States was poised for war with Mexico, Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote in his journal, quote, The United States will conquer Mexico, but it will be as the man swallows arsenic, which brings him down in turn. Mexico will poison us. In 1858, William Seward, the influential politician from New York and future Secretary of State to Abraham Lincoln, gave a speech in Rochester that referred to an impending irrepressible conflict. Quote, it is an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces, and it means that the United States must and will sooner or later become entirely a slaveholding nation or entirely a free labor nation. Either the cotton and rice fields of South Carolina and the sugar plantations of Louisiana will ultimately be tilled by free labor and Charleston and New Orleans become marts for legitimate merchandise alone, 
or else the rye fields and wheat fields of Massachusetts and New York must again be surrendered by their farmers to slave culture and the production of slaves. And Boston and New York become once more markets for trade in the bodies and souls of men. Failing to understand this unavoidable truth, Seward argued, was what made compromising pointless. That same year, Abraham Lincoln gave what has come to be called the House Divided speech. Quote, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing, or all the other. And of course, just a year later, John Brown slipped his final words to his jailer on his way to the gallows in a note. It read, quote, I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had as now vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. These statements, and there are more if we really wanted to get into it, do yet more to create that naturally progressing narrative. Thomas Jefferson predicted it as far back as 1820, you might say, thinking of Jefferson's fear of the fire bell in the night, that it was the Missouri Compromise. Surely what he meant was that the Missouri Compromise was a harbinger of doom, and that doom was obviously the Civil War. You can't deny the prescience of Lincoln's words about a crisis being reached and passed. And my goodness, John Brown's final words, it almost gives you a chill. But we also need to remember that those things give us a chill because we know the Civil War happened. But until 1861, no one knew there would be a Civil War. They might have worried that there would be one based on the increasing sectionalism, the growing violence, the irreconcilable differences between North and South. See, Even those phrases that I just used also make the war sound inevitable, right? But they didn't know that it would happen. So when we feel that shiver, when we read Brown's last statement, it's because we know how the story ended. And it's spooky that his prediction about, you know, being um, washed, well, what is it? Well, the the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, uh, but with blood, we know that that in a way came true, right? What we aren't considering in those moments are the many other sources that didn't suggest a bloodletting or a war or a crisis or a conflict. Those words stand out to us precisely because they fit into the narrative so well. So historians for generations have plucked them out in order to give us that shiver. That's not to say that they are not powerful. They are, but they don't mean that the war was inevitable. Right now, historians aren't debating whether the Civil War was an irrepressible conflict or the result of a bumbling generation. But the conversation remains. What was the final moment, the decisive event that made it war? What was the force that made these issues so intractable? Not just the abhorrent existence of slavery, that's a given, but the social forces, cultural practices, and political beliefs that made slavery an unsolvable problem. How did international events play a role? For instance, how did the historical memory of the Haitian Revolution shape what white and black abolitionists thought was possible? How did the abolition of slavery in the British Empire change the way Americans thought about their own system of enslavement? How did the global cotton economy influence what seceding Southerners believed they could achieve with disunion? If there was a road to disunion, where did it begin? How did Americans come to even think that disunion was a real possibility? We could keep asking these questions forever. (laughs) And I should say, I based all of those questions on a great historiographical article by Michael Woods in the Journal of American History, in which he has footnotes so packed with titles that one footnote takes up almost an entire page. It's, It's truly impressive. But I can already hear my colleagues here, like Averill and (laughs) Marissa and Elizabeth, asking, who cares, right? Why nitpick the causes of this particular war endlessly? 
And in fact, actually, I think many Civil War historians would actually agree, studies of the war's causes are way less common now than they were earlier in the 20th century. But as historian Jason Phillips has articulated, quote, this dormancy of Civil War causation research would be merely academic if the United States weren't barreling towards disunion again. We're living in a moment with a new kind of sectionalism, where Americans are so profoundly divided that we can't agree whether or not it's a good thing to wear masks scientifically proven to stop the spread of deadly diseases. And that division has deadly consequences. Mass shootings, many of which are motivated by right-wing ideology and all made possible by the political refusal to address the problem of gun ownership in this country, are happening nearly every week. Black Americans are murdered with impunity, whether by police officers or by white vigilantes feeling irritated on the subway or grumpy white men obsessed with the idea of home protection. Women's and trans people's civil rights are under attack. No small number of Americans refuse to accept the outcomes of free and fair elections, including a current presidential candidate. Let's end here with the words of historian David Blight, as he tried to answer whether we're also on the road to a civil war. Quote, Are today's myriad crises somehow equivalent to the great question of slavery in late antebellum America? Can our current rabble of loud difference still be governed? In a two-party system, the capture of one party by extremists is enough to cause great political havoc and violence, a lesson we should have learned from the destruction of our union in 1861. Authoritarianism is an American historical tradition, newly energized and threatening our Republican existence. In coming elections, we shall see whether our 21st century democracy will live or die honestly, whether we too are heading for collapse or renewal in politics, law, and civil conflict. How we answer such questions will determine whether it is 1857 again in America. Mic drop. You missed my stirring final speech. I read it. I was stirred. <laughs> you seem moved. <laughs> Super moved. But I mean, I think that one of the things that I didn't necessarily expect when I pitched this idea for our causality um, series was how often I would see in obviously in contemporary essays um, on the causes of the Civil War, this connection to our current moment. It came up over and over and over again that like, are we also on the brink of something? Or, you know, that's David Blight's entire article, which um, I have linked in the in the uh, transcript was um, written for the New York Times magazine. So it's it's publicly available, was written for public audiences, is entirely about that question, right? Mm -hmm. About um, as he ends here, right? Is it 1857 in America again? Like, are we are we also kind of approaching something? If 18, if Dred Scott in 1857 was the decisive turning point, are we coming upon our own Dred Scott? Right? And I, I honestly don't know how I feel about that question. Like, I. I find it really like it kind of gives me like the shivers, like it freaks me out a little bit. What do you think? I mean, it also just seems like there's so many more issues that could be contributing to that, right? Like it's women's rights. It's yeah, black rights. It's like civil rights ongoing yeah. conversation that has never ended and yeah. police brutality and conspiracy theories and yeah, I Yeah, I I, I I wonder if it's more multifaceted today um in that in the you know in 1857 the issue was slavery. Right. Right? That was the unsolvable issue. I wonder if what we're facing today can't be quite boiled down to one thing. 
right. right? In the same way, maybe that's irrelevant because it seems like all of those things are sort of all interconnected. Obviously, white supremacy, anti-trans, anti-abortion are all bundled up together, right? They, they make are. a really toxic sludge um, that seems to be kind of a package deal. But, you know, we don't like to we don't like to believe in inevitability. So I like to believe that there's still hope. Um, but it's scary, especially going into a, an, an election year. Yeah. I also just don't know that the people who oppose trans rights and women's rights and bodily autonomy and in our, you know, in, in who are white supremacists that they feel as threatened in our current institution, right? Like in our mm. current country, because their voices are loud enough in the the states that they're living in mm-hmm. that they're making laws that are negatively impacting those people, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're winning the fight there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and so and are the other like is New York and Minnesota going to step in? Are we loud enough and do we have enough power in the federal government? Do we have a majority like the, you know, and not to say that there's not Minnesotans and New Yorkers who are not also on the same, like, are also sure. like celebrating, f- oh, excuse me, um, anti-trans laws, right? Like, we know those people are there too, but who's going to, how is this going to be resolved? Like, right. I don't know. I don't know. Right. And I, I actually... When I think about this, um, you know, this question of like, are we headed for another civil war? I mean, one of the things that I actually think about is you kind of raised, which is like, what would that even look like? Yeah. Right. Because this civil war was marked by the fact that there was two sort of distinct regions. That's not to to say that everyone in those regions was uh, was, you know, believed the same thing as everyone else in those regions. That's obviously not the obviously case. Obviously not true. Yeah. Um, but overwhelmingly enough so that some states chose to secede and it created actually like Northern, like union states, Northern states and a Confederate state. So there's like yeah. actually a regional divide. This I feel like would be a giant mess, like yeah. territorially speaking, <laughs> right? Like yeah. what would that even look like? Um, which I know is like not actually probably the issue it would probably look a lot more like terrorism right yeah, than yeah, pitched yeah. battle which is also really scary um but it also makes me think like we're probably asking the wrong question like is it going to be yeah. something that we call the civil war or is it going to be you know s- sort of endless civil conflict like you might you know see in in other countries right now right um guerrilla styles yeah yeah of- Right. And we have a lot of people armed to the teeth and ready yeah. sort of to 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 get going. So anyway. Yeah. I don't know. That's a lot of food for thought out there, people. So it is. I didn't mean to bring down the vibe, but really brought the vibe down, Sarah. Thanks yeah. a lot for ruining this whole series on causality. Sorry, sorry. I thought I more. was I thought I did a good job not just making this whole thing historiography. So congratulations to me. <laughs> yeah, there was lots of long racist quotes. Sorry. I know. It's but listen, you it's how do you how do you get at this stuff without reading those quotes, right? Like Sure. Yeah. Agreed. Well, thanks for joining us today. We invite you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at dig underscore history or join our Facebook group, Dig History Pod Squad, for all kinds of memes and historian hijinks. If you have a comment or question or want to share some kind words with us, you can always email us at hello at digpodcast.org. We love listener mail. I have a special folder for it in my email. I put all the listener mail in there and I save it so I can open it when I'm sad. Yeah. If you're an educator, uh, we've got a compendium, like lots of episodes that you can use in the classroom. And we also have a lot of free teaching resources, including full lesson plans, all on our website, digpodcast.org. And that's where you'll also find our bibliographies, the scripts for all of our episodes, resources, and a link to our swag store, all at digpodcast.org. Yep. Thanks. (laughs) Bye. Bye.
This podcast was produced by the historians of DIG, Elizabeth Garner Masaryk, Sarah Hanley Cousins, Marissa Rhodes, and me, Avril Earls. Thanks for listening. What are you doing? Sorry. I was trying to find a nail file and then my drawer got stuck. Hmm. Well, mute yourself next time. Sorry. I didn't know I could. Okay. There's a little microphone in there. Got it. I'm still getting the Patreon. <laughs> Oh my god, I'll just do it. No, I got it, I got it, I got it. My computer was being slow because of the Zencaster. There we go. Okay. What are you doing? Uh, I'm packing <laughs> some food. <laughs> it's lunch time. What? In 1850? Was the compromise of 1850? Yes. <laughs> That's what happened. Do. I'm just gonna delete that. Why? Because it's obvious, it's obviated by 1850. Where just, where Justice Roger Taney issued the now infamous decision. Sorry, it's also pronounced Tawny. I'll kill you. Where Justice Roger, <laughs> sh- 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 no laughing. It's like in ten volumes. It's like it's literally thousands and thousands of pages long. <laughs> like, did you read it? I did not read the whole thing, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. I had no idea. What? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I thought. I thought it was because uh, people were stupid. But You're just out, learning all sorts of stuff. I was the stupid one. Yeah. I don't like I, it. I, I, I actually, I hope that's true. I'm pretty sure that it's short for Cotton Engine. You better Google that before we say it out loud. <laughs>